Hello, Curran here. This video is an introduction to JavaScript for programmers of other languages. The audience for this video is people who come from a programming background, like some language, any language, like Java or Ruby or Python. And you need to learn JavaScript quickly because you want to use it. What we're going to cover here is ECMAScript 6 syntax uh, and the most commonly used language features, uh, not all of them. We're going to draw from Eloquent JavaScript, an excellent free ebook online, and also this document ECMAScript 6 features. Within Eloquent JavaScript, this is what we're going to cover. These are sort of hand-picked sections. It's not all the sections of Eloquent JavaScript, uh, but these are the ones that contain the the language features that I see as useful on a day-to-day -day basis and sort of need to know parts of JavaScript. So let's dive in. The content that I'm about to go over is from this excellent online free ebook, Eloquent JavaScript by Marjin Heverbeke. I don't know how to say his name, but I want to give him credit because this is an amazing book and I'd encourage you to go through it in detail if you've got the time but I'm just going to go through some of these and use this content as sort of a prompt for me to explain um, different parts of JavaScript. I'd like to start by reading from this section of the introduction, what is JavaScript? JavaScript was introduced in 1995 as a way to add programs to web pages in the Netscape Navigator browser. The language has since been adopted by all major graphical web browsers and it has made modern web applications possible, where you can interact directly with the page without refreshing the page after every action. One interesting thing in the second paragraph is that JavaScript does not have anything to do with Java. The name was inspired by marketing considerations rather than good judgment, which I find an interesting piece of history. After its adoption outside of Netscape, a standard document was written to describe the way the JavaScript language should work. And this is called ECMAScript. It's a standard definition of the JavaScript language. So this is where, you know, ECMAScript comes in. There have been many versions of ECMAScript, um, and ECMAScript version 6 is sort of the latest uh, modern widely adopted version, and this is the version of JavaScript that we're going to cover. Next, I'd like to dive into Chapter 1, Values, Types, and Operators. What I'm going to do next is open the DevTools by hitting shift Control j And um, the DevTools I would, I would very highly recommend. These are sort of, it's the most useful way of interacting with web pages that have JavaScript on them. So in Chrome, this is how you open it. You go to this menu, click on More Tools, and then Developer Tools. Or just hit Control shift j Once you've got this open, you can change the size in here, uh, and there's different tabs. You can go to the Console tab, and you can change the size by hitting Control minus or Control shift plus So I'm going to make it sort of big here so that you can see the code that I write in here. At this point, I'd encourage you to follow along. Open up the Chrome browser, open up this console, and type what I type, and then experiment as we go along. And pause the video, experiment. Uh, I think this is how you'll learn the best. I'm just going to clear out these weird messages. As we scroll through the content, I'm going to explain concepts that come up, like numbers. JavaScript has numbers like any other language, so you can type in numbers like 1, 2, 3. What's happening here is that we're entering some JavaScript into the terminal, and then when we hit enter, it's executing whatever we type as JavaScript. These are integers. You could also have decimal numbers like, I don't know, 4.5. All numbers in JavaScript are represented as floating point 64-bit. JavaScript also has relatively standard arithmetic, so you can say like 100 plus 4 gives you 104. 
You can also parenthesize things. So instead of saying like 100 plus 4 times 11, which will multiply 4 by 11 first because of order of operations, you could put parentheses around things just like in standard math to uh, group these operations. So there's plus, multiply, uh, divide, you can divide, there's subtraction, 4 minus 3, all the sort of standard arithmetic that you would expect. Next up is strings. I'm going to clear out these numbers from our console. Strings in JavaScript are sequences of characters, and you can write them with double quotes like hello world, like that. You can also write them with single quotes, uh, which doesn't really make any difference. It's just different syntaxes. Um, the only reason you might want to use uh, the, the, both of these is when you have strings inside of other strings, like uh, quote hello inside. Or if, if you want to go the other way, you could have single quotes inside of double quotes like that. But that's sort of, it's an edge case, really. Uh, the modern JavaScript style uses mainly single quotes when you're writing code. Uh, double quotes are sort of old school. You see it in older code. Something that's new in ECMAScript 6 is these string literals where you use backticks. And this string can have new lines inside of it, which the other types of strings cannot. So in the terminal, in the console here, if you hit shift enter, you can make a new line. So this has finally come to JavaScript, <laughs> strings that have multiple lines. This backtick character is right to the left of the one key, by the way. You can use the plus operator with strings. So if you say hello, then you can say plus some, some other string, like world. And these get concatenated together, meaning they get sort of uh, attached into one big string. Another cool feature of these ES6 string literals is that you can use this dollar symbol to sort of inject some JavaScript into the string. So instead of saying, like, let's say, um, hello plus world, or let's say plus mm, five. Another way of saying this with string literals is using the back ticks and then using the dollar sign and then begin curly braces. Then you can put whatever JavaScript you want inside that curly brace and then end curly brace and then end back tick. And that's equivalent to using the plus operator here. Another type of operator is unary operators. I'll clear this out. Uh, one thing that's useful sometimes is determining the type of something. So you could say type of 5. It'll say, okay, this is a number. And if you say type of hello, this is a string. And you can say type of an empty object is object. And type of empty array is also object, which is a little strange, but there's ways to figure out the difference between arrays and objects. Another example of a unary operator is the minus sign. So you can say minus 6 gives you a negative number. JavaScript has Boolean values, meaning true or false. So these are, you can just type true, that's a value. False, that's another value. These are not strings, these are sort of you know, keywords of the language. You can compare things to generate Boolean values, like 2 is less than 3. Is it? True. Or you could say 5 is less than 3. False. 
you can also compare strings to one another. Like A is less than B. True. But is B less than A? False. This compares by alphabetic uh, ordering or alphanumeric ordering. There's also greater than or equal to. So 4 is greater than or equal to 4. True, but 4 is not greater than 4. And there's also equality testing. You could say is 5 equal to 5? True, but is hello equal to hello? True. If it's lowercase, they're not the same. Also, there's the inverse of this, not equal. So you could say, hello, not equals, hello. That's true, because they're not equal. They're not the same. You got to be careful in JavaScript, though, because using the double equal sign, it, it does really flexible. It's, it's a really flexible version of equality testing. So you could say 1 is equal equal to 1, the string, and it says true. But that's like not, that's not really the case, and it can lead to some tricky bugs. So I would always recommend to use the three equal signs, which does a more strict value comparison. So the string 1 is equal to the string 1. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this, these two are not the same thing with this more strict equality testing. There's also these logical operators like AND and OR. True and true is true. True and false is false because they're, they're not both true. They both need to be true for the AND operator to return true. And then there's OR. True or false. Only one of these needs to be true for the result to be true. So that's AND and OR. There's also not, which just inverts the Boolean value. So if you say not true, that's false. If you say not false, that's true. And finally, there's this really cool syntax called the ternary operator. This is an expression where the first element is a Boolean value, let's say true. Then you can say, is it true? If it is, then give me one. If it's not true, though, give me zero. And this gives us one. But if the Boolean value is false here, it gives us zero. And you can put any JavaScript expression into any of these slots. So you could say, like, is 4 less than 5? If so, give me yes. Otherwise, give me no. And typically, when you see this in actual programs, it's indented like this. There's a new line, and then two spaces, and then a question mark uh, with, it, with the true value, and then indented again by two spaces with the false value. This makes it easier to read in the code and sort of spot as the ternary operator. There's also these special values of being empty, which is null and undefined. Null is null. Undefined is undefined. And we'll see later where these come up. But they're both sort of indications that something hasn't been uh, defined, or it's just empty, or it's, you know, it doesn't exist. All right, that's all I'm going to cover from Chapter 1, Values, Types, and Operators. Let's move on to the next part, which is Chapter 2, Program Structure. Let's talk about expressions and statements. A statement is sort of a, a unit of the program. It's like a sentence in English, and it's usually concluded by a semicolon. So we could say things like one or false with a semicolon, and this is sort of a little mini program that gets run. In JavaScript, you don't actually need the semicolon at the end, but I think it's sort of uh, standard practice to include it because it sort of makes the programs more readable. Next, let's talk about bindings, or actually variables. 
bindings is sort of a, it's you know it's usually called a variable, and in ES6 there's two different types of variables let and const. And by the way, in ES5, ECMAScript version five, it's var. So if you see this, um, you know it means that's a variable. You can say var x equals let's say five. This is the same as saying in ES6 let x equals five. Oh, <laughs> I'm getting a syntax error. It's already been declared. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. You can only declare a variable once. So let's say let y equals six. And then once we've defined the variable y and assigned its value to something like six, we can say y and it will give us back that value that's been assigned to it. You can assign values um, of any type to these variables. So we could say let message equals, let's say, a string. Hello. Whoops. Forgot the end there. So we've defined message to be hello, and we can say message, and that's hello. And any of those operators from before can be applied to variables too. So we could say message plus y, for example. And what this will do is concatenate six after hello. By the way, this console is outputting the thing that gets returned by each of these statements. And it just so happens that a statement that declares a variable returns undefined. So that's why this is undefined here. Eloquent JavaScript doesn't seem to cover const, so but I would like to talk about it. It's another kind of variable. You can say const, you know, x equals five. And then the thing about const is that you're not allowed to reassign its value to something different than what it was initialized to. So if I try to say x equals four, it says nope can do that assignment to a constant variable. Whereas if we use let, you know, let y equals six, and then we can say y equals seven and change its value, and that's fine because we used let, it's not const. When you write larger programs, const is preferable because it's easier to reason about what it could be in the future. So I tend to use const as sort of the default and then change it to let as need be. Next, I'd like to talk about the console.log function. Because we're in the browser, we get a lot of these um, global variables in our environment. For example, window is a global variable, um, document. And all of these has, have different uses, you know, in different contexts. But I think one of the most useful global variables is console which has a bunch of functions on it one of which is log console.log something we can put any any expression in here like foo it will print it out to the console so I'm just using this uh, this console here so it's not very useful, but once we start making programs that are stored in files, console.log becomes really, really useful to output values of things over time. Next, I'd like to talk about conditional execution. This means that un under a certain condition, some certain code will be executed, but if that condition is not true, you can execute some other code. And this can be done with the if keyword in JavaScript. So I'll clear this console here. So let's define a boolean. Const is it true is, let's say, four is less than five. And then we can say if is it true, in that case, and by the way, in the in the console, if you want multiple lines, you have to use shift enter, because if you hit enter, it'll execute. So shift enter to make multiple lines. If it's true, we can say console 
dot log. Yes, it's true. Otherwise, you could say else. We can say console.log. No, it's not true. So when we run this, if this Boolean value is true, then this code will run. Otherwise, this code will run. So if I run this, it says, yes, it is true. And unfortunately, I can't reassign is it true because it's a const. But if I say let uh, possibly true equals uh, false. And then we use the same logic, but we use possibly true instead. It logs out no to the console. So this is conditional execution with if and else. Next, I want to just briefly talk about comments. You can add comments in programs to sort of add some descriptions around your code. So one form of comment is these single line comments, which are slash slash. So you could say like, you know, this is a comment. And it doesn't do anything. It, you know, it doesn't run. And another type of comment, you can use slash star with multiple lines, multi-line comment. And then end it with star slash. This is convenient if you want to write like a paragraph of text in your code. Next, I'd like to talk about loops. Loops are pieces of code that execute multiple times and stop under a certain condition. So rather than, you know, console.log 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, we can write a piece of code that will do this for us. And it will look like this. Let number equals 0, which defines this variable and assigns it to 0. And we can say while this number is less than 12, console.log this number, and then increment this number by 2. So what I can do is just copy this and paste it into the console and run it and see it outputs 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. And by the way, there is a more succinct way to add a number to a variable, and that is plus equals. So we can say number plus equals 2, and it's the same as saying number equals number plus 2. And this will output the same thing. Oh, I've already defined number. So let me just assign number to be 0 again, and then run that code. Then it's fine. And by the way, with while loops, you got to be really careful not to crash the browser because like if you don't have this condition met ever, like so if we don't increment the number by 2, if I run this, it actually just you know, keeps running forever and it ends up usually crashing the browser tab. So be careful about while loops. And I don't think there's really any way to stop this, so I just got to close the tab here. But anyway, I would like to talk about for loops too. I mean, I don't use these much, to be honest, because there's for each on arrays, which we'll talk about later. But it is sort of a fundamental part of the language. So let me just show you an example of a for loop. You can say for let, let's say i, this is a convention, equals 0. i is less than, let's say, 10 i plus plus and by the way i plus plus is equivalent to saying i equals i plus one you know I, I equals i plus one is the same thing as saying i plus plus it increments i and then you can have curly braces and have whatever code you want so let me say console.log i and this will print out all these integers from zero till nine so those are four loops. All right, now we're done with chapter two, program structure. On to chapter three, functions. 
All right, defining a function. And f yeah, functions are like the coolest part of JavaScript. Uh, it's the, f the sort of, you know, essential essence of the language. JavaScript is actually a, f could, could be considered a functional language. I've heard it called uh, Lisp in C's clothing. And we'll see that more with higher order functions. But first, let's just define a function. We can say function square and the structure is parentheses and then curly braces and the thing that goes inside the parentheses it's the arguments of the function so let's say x we're gonna pass in some number to this function we're gonna call it x inside of these curly braces x is only visible inside of these curly braces then we can say return x times x. So we've defined a function called square that will square whatever number we pass into it. And we can invoke this function by saying square with some parentheses. And then inside these parentheses, we pass in some value, like let's say 5. And the square of 5 is 25. So that's one way we can define the function square. But actually, there's another way. We can say, uh, well, I'll use let because I might want to reassign it. Let sq, because I think squares I've already defined it, so I, I can't reuse the same name. Or maybe I can just overwrite it. I don't know. But let's say let sq equals function of x. And then again, return x times x. This is another way of defining functions. And it's actually equivalent to this one. Uh, but with, when you use this syntax, it does this thing called hoisting, where you can access this in the code before it's actually defined. But that's kind of a, a subtle point. Um, usually, nowadays, I see functions defined more like this. Now, this syntax for defining functions is from ES5. And people use this arrow function notation from ES6 more frequently nowadays. So let's define our sq function as an arrow function. So we say sq equals, it's going to be equivalent to what's above, but this time we can just say parentheses goes to, with this fat arrow here, x times x and x is going to be in this, these parentheses as our single argument. So w when we define it like this, see how much less code it is? But it does the same thing. We can say sq of uh, 5, and we get 25. And you know, we can even simplify it more, because if there's one argument, we can actually get rid of these uh, parentheses. So here we're defining this square function in drastically uh, less code than the, with this other notation of function. So that's arrow functions in a nutshell. Yeah, here's, an, here's another good comparison. Uh, with arrow functions, you can actually also have these curly braces, but you don't need the curly braces if you, if you just have one statement. But if you have multiple statements, like you know, let me just give an example. We say sq equals a function that takes us input x, and then we execute whatever's inside of these curly braces. And inside of these curly braces, we have our, our own new scope where we can define new variables that are just limited to inside of these curly braces. This is called a closure of the function. We can say, let's say const the answer is x times x and then we can say return the answer Oops. like this so if you have multiple statements inside of the function use the curly braces and again this this computes the square just the same next let's talk about recursion Recursion is when a function invokes itself, which is kind of a crazy thought. 
My favorite example of this is um, factorial. This is the definition of the factorial function. It's, you know, we take the number, we multiply it by that number minus one. So this is a recursive definition right here of factorial. We say n factorial is n multiplied by n minus one factorial until we get down to zero, in which case it returns one. So let's write this factorial function in JavaScript as a recursive function. So we can start by saying const factorial equals, it's a function of, let's say, n. So n is the input. And here we can actually use the ternary notation. And we can say, is n equal to 0? And if it is, in that case, we return 1. Otherwise, we return factorial of n minus 1. So this is a nice summary or combination of a bunch of language features that we've learned already. So let's test it out. If we say factorial of, let's test the zero case. Factorial of zero should give us one. There we go, we get one. Factorial of one should also be one, but factorial of two is one. Let's see, <laughs> is this right? This doesn't seem right, actually. Oh, right, <laughs> I forgot to multiply it. It's, it should be n times factorial of n minus one. So let's try this again. Const factorial equals a function of n where if n is equal to zero, then we return one. Otherwise, we return, and this is where I did it wrong last time, n times factorial of n minus 1. This should be the correct definition. So let's try factorial of, let's say, 4. There we go. So it's 4 times 3 factorial, which is 3 times 2 factorial, and so on. So we can actually test this against that list from Wikipedia by writing a for loop and then logging out factorial of all the numbers, let's say, from 1 to 10. So we could say for let i equals 0. That's the initializing case. i is less than 10. That's the condition that gets checked every time. And then i plus 1. That increments i each time we go through the loop. And then inside of this loop, we can say console.log factorial of i. And i is different every time to, through the loop. So if we run this, we see all of these numbers, the various values of factorial. So let's see, does this match the list in Wikipedia? Yeah, it looks about the same. 1, 1, 2, 6, 24, 120. Is that what we've got? Yep, 1, 2, 6, 24, 120. Looks right to me. Now I'd like to give you an exercise. Write a recursive function that computes the Fibonacci number of n. So that's recursion in a nutshell. All right, that's all we're going to talk about in Chapter 3, functions. Let's move on to Chapter 4, data structures, objects, and arrays. All right, data structures, objects, and arrays. This is sort of the meat and potatoes of JavaScript development. You need to be fluent in objects and arrays to be effective when programming JavaScript. To learn about objects and arrays, let's consider a scenario where you're looking to buy a car and you want to do some analysis of the situation using JavaScript. 
So one way you might think of representing a car is how you'd say it. Like the first car I bought was, let's say, let car equals a string. Uh, the first car I bought was a 1997 Honda Accord. And the price of that that I paid was $2,800. So when we have this, though, it's just a string and it's difficult to access the various parts of this. So what we can do instead is we can make car into an object. An object you can define in JavaScript with opening and closing curly braces. And then inside of these curly braces, you have keys and values. And keys are also called properties sometimes. So let's think about 1997. This is the year that the car was made. So we can say year as the key and then a colon to define the value which would be 1997 which we can define here as a number. And then we can add multiple properties to this car object like make is Honda and model is Accord and price is let's say 2800. This is how we can define a car object. The Chrome Dev Tools have really nice support for objects. Now let's say you want to know what the year of this car is. You can access the year property of the car with a dot. You can say car dot year and this will return 1997 and you can do the same for the other properties like make it just says okay the make of this car is Honda another way of accessing properties of objects is using these square brackets and when you use square brackets you can pass in a string instead of this literal here like year or make so let's access the year this way. See here year is a string and it also returns 1997. This is useful in cases where you have a variable that stores the property name. So let's say we have a, a variable called property and the property is year. Then we can say car at property and it's the same same thing as saying car.year. It's going to give us 1997. Both the dot notation and the square bracket notation can be used also to assign new values within this object. So let's say like I accidentally mistyped year and the year should have been 1998. I can say car.year equals 1998 to overwrite that previous value. And I can also say car at year with this syntax equals, oh, let's say 2000. This is another way to overwrite the values. And by the way, the way I access that is using the up arrow. I accessed what I had previously typed. This is super useful when you're in the console, up and down arrows. So that's objects in a nutshell. Now let's talk about arrays. We've got these cars on the left here. Um, you know, many cars, it's not just one car. So let's say we want to keep track of this list of cars. We can say let cars equals an array. And an array in JavaScript is square brackets, just like this. So this is an empty array. But before we define cars, let's just think about some other arrays. Like you can have arrays of numbers and you can define it like this, one, two, three. This is an array with three elements, one, two, and three. Um, you can also have arrays of strings, like A, B, C. Any value you can put in a variable, you can put into an array. And unlike other languages, arrays are not typed, so you could have mixed types. And you could also have objects within arrays. So here's you know, an array with one object, let's say name is uh, Accord, and then another object 
with a different name. Name is, um, I don't know, Fiat. This is an array that contains two objects. So back to our cars example, we can say cars equals an array with a single element for now, which is our car that we defined earlier. So now if we inspect this, we can see, okay, it's an array that has a single object, this car that we had constructed earlier. And using the Chrome DevTools, we can unpack this and see the details here. Arrays have a bunch of methods, one of which is push, and we can use push to add new entries to this array, to, to push more elements onto it. So we can say, let's say we want to add a new car to our list of cars. We can say cars.push. This is a, a function that takes a single argument, which is an object, or it could be anything really, whatever you want to push onto the array. But in our case, we want to push a new car onto this array. So let's take this first entry here. What's the make? It is Nissan. What's the model? Model is Leaf. What's the year? Year is, um, the year is 2012 here. And what's the price? The price they're selling for is $1,800. So when we execute this, it returns the number of elements in the array. And if we inspect the cars variable, we can see, okay, now it's an array with two objects, these two different cars. So let's push a couple more cars onto this array so we have something to uh, work with. Again, I used the up arrow to get what I had before. Now I'm going to put this next entry in here. Let's push a Ford F-150 2009 going for 1950. Next, let's push this 2009 Chevy Trailblazer going for 1550. And lastly, let's push this Honda Pilot 2003 going for 2200. If we want to know how many cars we've got in our inventory here, we can use cars.length. Length is a property on any array that tells you how many elements are there. The way you can access individual elements in an array is using square brackets. So let's say we want to get the first car in our list. We can say cars at index 0. The index starts at 0, not 1. So this will give us the first in our list. Cars at index 1 will give us the second, and so on up until cars at index 4, which is the last one in our list. And cars at index 5 doesn't exist because there's only 5 cars in the list and the index goes from 0 to 4. So that's how you can access individual elements of an array. Now let's say you want to loop through this array and um, print out, let's say, all the prices of the cars. There's a couple ways you can do this. One of which is the standard vanilla for loop, where you could say for let i equals zero. i is less than, well, what does i need to be less than, actually? This is the length of the array, cars.length. i plus plus to increment our index. And then inside of these curly braces, we can extract one car from this array. So let's say let car equals cars at index i. This will get each and every car out. And actually, since we're not going to be reassigning this, and it's in the scope of these curly braces, we can use const here instead of let. And then what were we wanting to see about each car? I think it was the price. So we can say console.log car.price. This will print out the price of each of these cars. Another way of iterating over arrays is to use for of. We can say for car of 
cars and then put the same stuff inside of our curly braces except for now we don't need to manually get the car out of the cars array because it's there already so this is one simplification and it does the same thing a third way of iterating over arrays which I find the most frequently used uh, at least for me is using functional programming and using the built-in for each method of arrays we can say cars dot for each and this is actually a higher order function that takes as input a function and the function gets past the car so we can say okay we have a function that takes as input one argument the car and then in the body of this function we can console.log the price so that prints the same thing and this is by far what I use most commonly because it allows you to extract the definition of this function for example we can define a function print car price equals and that's, that can be this function here it takes as input a car and what it does is console.log the price of that car and then we can say cars.foreach print car price which will invoke that function for each and every car so that's how you can extract a function out of a for each statement but now let's say you know instead of just printing out these you want to do something else with these prices um, and what you'd like to do first is get a new array that just has the array of prices for this you can use map we can say cars.map this is another high order function that takes as input each element of the array in this case cars and we can say return car dot price and because it's an arrow function we don't actually need to say return it can just look like this what this will do is create a new array that just has all the prices of the cars this is how you can use array.map so let's say you want to ask the question what's the cheapest car or rather what are the what are the prices of the cars sorted from lowest to highest you can say um, dot sort on any array so what first what I'll do is I'll say const prices equals this expression here whoops that should be prices const prices equals that expression here now we have this array of prices in a variable and we can say prices dot sort now we have the sorted order of these prices all right so we have a nice spread and let's say our budget is less than two thousand dollars and we only want to really look at the cars in our list that are less than two thousand dollars to isolate the cars that are less than two thousand dollars we can use filter cars.filter this is another higher order function on arrays that takes as input each element of the array a car and it returns a boolean value and if that boolean value is true then this car is included in the filtered array and if not it's excluded so let's say filter out the cars where car dot price is less than two thousand this creates a new array that only includes those cars where the price is less than two thousand so that's how you can use array.filter super useful now let's say we want a report of the cars that are less than two thousand dollars this format is you know rather technical what if we could come up with a string like this for each car that's less than two thousand dollars we can go about doing this by first writing a function that will format one car like this and then 
format all of our cars in our list using that function. Let's start by making this function format car. Let format car equals a function that takes as input one car and returns as output, well, what do we want? We want to say, let's say 97 Honda Accord. 97 is the year. Um, so we can use this string literal approach from earlier and we can say, all right, let's say car dot year. A 97 Honda Accord. Honda is the make. So we can say space car dot make space car dot model and then what was the format I used colon dollar sign and then the price so we want to make it look like that so in our string literal I can say colon space dollar sign and then include that that special keyword or that special pattern that template pattern to say car dot price so this should print out the car in that format. So let's try it out. Format car, I believe I had that first car in a variable, just called car. All right, it worked. 2003 Honda Pilot. Sweet. Just as a refresher, this syntax here with the dollar sign and the curly brackets inside of a string literal, it means that anything inside of these curly braces can be JavaScript and um, it will evaluate the value that you put in here and then put it into the string. For example car.year is 2003 and so that's what shows up here when that string gets um, evaluated. One problem that I see or feel with this format car function is that it's too long and there's too much repetition. We can say car dot car dot car dot Let's refactor this function a little bit to be more concise. First of all, I'm going to introduce curly braces so that we can have multiple expressions in here. And I'll say return this expression. Whoops. I'll just reassign it and then test it out to make sure that it still works. OK, so there's no real improvement yet. But what I'd like to do is extract these into local variables so that we can just say return year, make, model, and price. And first, you know, we need to de define these variables. And we can say const year equals car.year. And the same thing for model and price. We're extracting these to local variables so that we don't need car dot every time in our string literal expression here. So let's see, does this still work? All right, it still works. But again, we still have a lot of repetition. Car dot, car dot, car dot. And this is where this notion of destructuring comes in handy. We can do the same thing here by saying const year comma make comma model comma price and curly brace and let me just indent this here equals car this does the same thing as this code up here but you know with less code and this is a new feature of ES6 it's called destructuring Object destructuring like this, it makes new variables, year, make, model, and price, and then assigns them automatically based on their names to be car.year, car.make, car.model, and car.price. So let's see if this works. All right, it still works. So that's how we can use destructuring to make our code a little cleaner. Now, as the grand finale, let's do the following. Let's make a report formatted like this for all of the cars that are available to us that are under $2,000. 2003 
To do this, we can say cars dot filter like we did before to filter out the cars where the car dot price is less than two thousand dollars and once we've got that list of cars and keep in mind filter returns a new array so on that new array we can call dot map to apply a function to all of those filtered car and that function can be format car So what this gives us, oops, there's a syntax error there that should be a fat arrow. Yeah, takes as input car returns a boolean is the car price less than $2,000. So what this gives us is the formatted list of the cars whose price is less than $2,000. And let's say in practice you don't want to print out this array, but you want to just print out a list of these strings you can actually join together multiple entries in, a, in an array into one string with dot join and if you do this it will concatenate all of these strings together like this but what we want to do is join on a new line so we can say backslash n to say okay in between each of these strings put a new line for me so that we get a nicely formatted list and here we go. This is our report of the cars whose price is less than $2,000. One last thing I want to talk about relating to objects and arrays is the notion of JSON. J-S-O-N. J-S-O-N. This means JavaScript Object Notation. So let's say we've got this scenario where I present my findings to, you know, my buddy Bill and he's like, you know, I want to do my own analysis. Could you send me that data of the cars? And you're like, well, how do I do that? They're in a variable called cars. One thing you can do is call json.stringify and then send your buddy Bill the resulting string. So let's say json.stringify cars. And by the way, json is built into the browser environment. It's also built into Node.js. So if you run this, json.stringifyCars, you get this big string which is in the JSON format. And JSON format is just like JavaScript literals with the only main difference is that the keys of objects need to be quoted. Otherwise it's not valid JSON. So you send this to your buddy Bill. He says, hey, I can't read that. It's just one big string. It's not indented or anything. And one thing you can do to fix that is pass in as the third argument to json.stringify. Well, the second argument is, is null, but the third argument, I'm going to say two, which means indent by two spaces. So if you run this, you get nicely formatted json, which you can send off to your buddy Bill. And, you know, I, I don't even remember what the second argument is. Let me just um, search for that real quick. And by the way, when you search for JavaScript functions, I always like to put MDN before it because that's the best documentation for JavaScript that's out there. So can, I can say, okay, Google for MDN, JSON stringify. There it is. It's in the MDN uh, Mozilla Web Docs uh, pages here. So this should tell us what the second argument is. It's the replacer a function that alters the behavior of the stringification process. So it's basically something we don't need to use, so we can just provide null. Yeah, that's what the second argument is. So let's say you take this text, copy it, and send an email to your buddy Bill, and he's like, well, what do I do with this? I want to get this from a string into a variable. And you're like, oh, don't worry about it. You can use json.parse. So this, this will return an object, which we can define as a new variable like uh, const new cars equals json.parse, and then we can just paste that big string into there. Um, oh, the quoting is confused. So let's use, um, oh, <laughs> we need to use the backtick actually for strings with multiple lines. All right, so we put it in a backtick so it will work in the console 
and this is our expression. And so when we evaluate this, we get new cars is now this beautifully structured array of objects. So that's how you can use json.stringify and json.parse. So that's all I'd like to cover for arrays and objects. Next, I'd like to talk about the idea of modules. Modules, well, it's a way to split your code into multiple files so that the complexity of your program can scale easily and you can organize things so you don't end up with one file that's a million lines long. For this part, I'd like to use a tool that's called vizhub.com. This is a tool that I created for teaching uh, JavaScript programming and making videos. Um, it handles modules for you so that you don't have to set up a local development environment. So what I'm going to do is sign in with GitHub and you can follow along, do the same. I'm going to say create visualization. We can fork this hello world example by clicking on this fork link or button right here. What I'm going to do next is just delete all of this uh, starter content and explain everything from scratch. And the title is going to be Cars Report. We're going to make modules for the Cars example that we just worked through. In VizHub, there's this notion of bundling files, which you'll see a lot. And by the way, this is a, a, a very basic HTML document. So this HTML page is loading in this script, bundle.js, that gets regenerated by a bundling tool called Rollup. And Rollup is an open source project that implements ES6 modules. So whenever you change the code in VizHub, this file gets generated from index.js. So in index.js, let's just get something to show up on the screen over here so we have a place to start. Let's say const message is hello world. And then to get it to show up in our HTML page, we need to interact with the DOM a little bit, the DOM, document object model. In our index.html, let's create a, uh, a pre tag, which is pre formatted text, pre, not pre. And if we put some text in here, like, hello, see it shows up there. Very small text, but it shows up. Um, so let's give this pre-tag an ID so that we can refer to it in our JavaScript. And we can say, all right, the ID of this is message. Now, in our index.js, um, we can get access to this DOM element with just the built-in DOM API, not using any libraries, we can say document dot get element by ID. This is a function that's built into the browser, and we can pass in the ID of this element as a string, which is message. And to make it less confusing, I'm going to make this div have a, a different ID than our variable. Let's say message dash uh, element. So we can say, all right, select our message dash element. Then once we've got access to this element, we can say dot text content equals message. And now it shows up here as hello world. And the text is so small. I, I didn't want to get into CSS in this video, but I'm just going to add a bit of CSS. And we can say the style of this pre tag is, let's just make the font bigger. Font dash size is, let's say, 3 em, you know, three times as large as it would normally be. This is an example of inline CSS by setting the style attribute. But anyway, what we want to do here is, you know, make our cars report in here. So I'll just make that one line. What I'm going to do next is copy-paste a bunch of the code that we had in our terminal, in our console, 
into this file. We have a JSON string here available for our cars, so I'm just going to copy and paste this into this code here, and I'm going to make a new variable. Let's call it um, cars. Const cars equals. I'm going to paste that in here. This is JSON actually, so I'm going to rename this to cars JSON. And then from here, we're going to parse this into an array of objects. We're going to say const cars equals json.parse cars json. So now this should work, but already our file is getting too long to see in one page. So already what we can do is extract what's here into a module. What we can do is make a new file, call it cars.js, and then I'm going to cut this code out of here and paste it into this file cars.js. And to make this into an ES6 module, all we need to do is add this new keyword called export. Export const cars equals this thing and this will export cars from this module. Now that we've exported cars from cars.js, we can import this module in our index.js by using the import keyword. Import curly braces cars from, in quotes, the name of the file, which is cars.js. And just to see, just to make sure that this is working, we can set the message to be something from cars, like cars at index zero dot make. Okay, it's Honda. This is working. This is great. And by the way, you can omit dot js because everything is dot js when you're working with modules. All right, that's it. We've created and used our first module, which is our list of cars. Just to recap what's going on here, in cars.js we define this variable called cars, which is an array of objects that gets exported from here and then imported into here. So here we can access cars, which is this array. The first element of the cars array is this car right here, a 2000 Honda Accord. And so when we say cars at zero, we're extracting that first car and we're saying dot make. We're extracting the make of the first car in our list. And then we're assigning that to message and then displaying that on the page. So next, let's make our whole report on this page. In our console from earlier, we had this expression here, cars.filter.map.join. So let's put this over here. And this is not going to work because format car is not defined. So I'm going to copy our definition of format car, which is this here. And then we need to say const to declare this. Const format car is this function. So to check that this is working, we can say format car, just this first car, just to check if everything's working. All right, 2000 Honda Accord going for 2800. And you know, I'm confused as to why the dollar sign is not coming through. Maybe we need to escape it? No, that doesn't work. Hmm. All right, if I put two dollar signs there, it works. It's confusing to me why that is, but that works. So let's leave it. So now that we got one car to show up, let's get all the cars to show up like this. And that's what this code here is doing. So we can assign the return value from here to a variable. Let's call it uh, report. Const report equals this. And then our message could just be our report. All right, it worked. Great. But just to demonstrate how we can split this into multiple modules, like this index.js is doing a bunch of things, right? So let's put this format car into its own module. I'm going to cut this out of here 
with control X make a new file called format car.js and then paste that text into here and then change it so we export const format car from this file. So now back in our index.js we can import format car from format car .js. And again we can omit that JS and it will be fine. All right, that's how we can refactor and split out a function from index.js into a separate file. Lastly, let's split out this logic into another separate module. Um, one sort of problem here is that it depends directly on cars, so we can actually make this a function like generate report that takes as input cars and it returns cars.filter.map.join and by the way in VizHub you can select multiple lines and then hit control square bracket to indent all of them. So now we've got this function generate report and we can call it with cars. That way the definition of generate report does not need to import cars directly. It can be passed in. That way, like, we could load cars from, you know, cars could be anything. And we just pass it into this function, generate report. And if we're going to make this a module, probably we shouldn't hard code this $2,000 here. You know, you could generate a report for other prices. So we can say, instead of 2000 we can say uh, max price. And then make that another argument to this function. And when you have multiple arguments in an arrow function, you do need the parentheses. So we can say generate report of cars, comma, 2000. Let's make this generate report function into another module. So I'm going to cut it from here, make a new file called generate report. And then in this file, generate report, I'm going to paste that definition. Oops, I should have added .js. So to rename this, I'm going to double click and say generate report .js. Now we get the syntax highlighting. And then here we can say export const generate report. Now in our index.js, we can import generate report from generate report.js. Now it should all be working, but it appears that something is broken. So at this point I'm going to open up the dev tools, control shift J, and see what's going on. Oh, format car is not defined. Ah, this is perfect. A perfect example of modules. So what's going on is generate report is using format car. So what we need to do is import format car into this module. See in index.js we're not even using format car anymore. So we can actually simplify index.js by removing this import and then adding it to generate report. So at the top of the file we can say import format car from format car. There we go. All right. So now we've got a super simple index.js that just imports the data, it imports the generate report function, it passes the data into the generate report function and then displays it on the page. And then cars is just our data, generate report is a module that imports another module. This is called transitive dependency, by the way. So generate report imports format car, invokes it for all the cars, and we get our nice report. So that's an overview of how you can use ES6 modules. And again, by the way, this is not running directly. It's being compiled, if you will, into this bundle.js, 
which contains actually all the code in one file. And the tool that's doing this is called Rollup. And this is what's running in our index.js. And I think I'll just add a brief description here. An example tutorial of how to use JavaScript objects, arrays, and modules. See, it shows up here. The very last topic I'd like to cover is asynchronous programming. Asynchronous programming is um, dealing with things that take some time to complete. All the code that we've dealt with so far is synchronous, meaning it happens right away. But a lot of things are asynchronous. They take some time. For example, a request to the network. And this is sort of a visual depiction of synchronous versus asynchronous. Here's a synchronous example. It's one uh, thread of control. And by the way, JavaScript is single-threaded. And this is what an asynchronous um, control flow looks like, where one thread of control sort of dispatches two asynchronous things that are happening over time. And then once they finish, then your code continues executing, maybe with the result of like a network, network request or something like that. So that's the concept of asynchronous. One utility that's commonly used in JavaScript is set timeout. Set timeout. What this does is it takes two arguments. The first argument is a function that will be invoked. So we can define a function here, console.log. Let's say, yeah, tick, just like in this example here. And the second argument to set timeout is the number of milliseconds that it should wait. So if I type a thousand milliseconds, that's one second. So after one second, this function, a callback function, will be invoked. So if I hit enter, boom, one second passes and then tick gets output. And so if I change this to 2000, hit enter, one, two, Boom, after two seconds, tick gets output. By the way, the thing that gets returned from set timeout is sort of an ID for that timeout that you can use in case you want to cancel that timeout in the future. And I believe there's something like clear timeout. Yeah, so if you wanted to, you could pass this ID into clear timeout to um, sort of say, okay, I don't want to get called anymore <laughs> in the future. This is an example of something asynchronous using a callback pattern. But what p most things use in uh, modern JavaScript is this notion of promises. For the longest time, callbacks were used to deal with asynchronous programming. But um, over time, it, it sort of became clear that it leads to somewhat messy and uh, difficult to manage code. And so promises were invented as like an abstract way to deal with asynchronous things. And now promises are standard in the JavaScript language. You don't need any libraries to use promises like you did a couple of years back. So to get familiar with promises, let's just start using them. Let's create a new promise. Let's say uh, let my promise equals new promise. And a promise sort of represents um, something that will happen in the future. Either it will succeed or it will fail. So the, the way that you can construct a promise is that it takes as input a function. And that function takes as input two things, which are both functions also, resolve and reject. And inside of the body of this function, we can execute some asynchronous things, and then once those asynchronous things are done, we should either call resolve with a value or reject with an error. So we can take this code up here, set timeout, and then instead of saying console.log tick, we can say, all right, resolve. And we don't have to pass anything necessarily into resolve. So we can create this promise. And then after two seconds, it will resolve. But because we're not um, listening for anything to happen in here, uh, nothing is really executing. So after we define it, 
I'm going to use shift enter so it doesn't e execute quite yet. I'm going to say, okay, my promise dot then. And this is how you can intercept the success value from a promise. Or, you know, run some code when the promise finishes. So dot then takes as input a function. And then in this function, we can say, you know, console.log, uh, you know, the promise resolved. And I think this will throw an error because we already defined my promise, so I'm going to reassign it. So when we run this code, after two seconds, it says promise resolved. Oh, I mistyped it. <laughs> but that came out after two seconds. And by the way, promise needs to be uppercase. Um, to resolve to the right thing in the environment. Usually when you're dealing with promises though, usually you call a function that returns a promise. So let's make a function that returns a promise just to see what that looks like. So let's say we want a function that will resolve the promise after a certain number of seconds. So we can say let, I'm going to call it wait seconds. And this will be a function that takes as input uh, the number of seconds, and it returns a promise, a new promise. And again, a promise you can define as a function that takes as input two functions, resolve and reject. And because I'm not going to use reject, I'm just going to you know, type um, resolve. And in that case, we don't need these parentheses. And in the body of this function, again, we can use set timeout. And the function that we can pass as the first argument to set timeout is, well, a function that calls resolve. And the second argument is the number of milliseconds, which is num seconds times 1,000. And just for fun, let's pass something into resolve, like, um, I don't know, message. And then we can define our message to be like, oh yeah, so many seconds have passed. So for that, we can use a string literal and say, okay, this so many seconds, num seconds, have passed. All right, so we can define this function, which doesn't do anything until we invoke it. And let's invoke this and then print out this message once it comes back. So we can say, all right, wait seconds. And we can pass in, let's say, two, two seconds. And then this returns a promise. So we can say dot then do something with the result, which we can call message. We can just say, all right, console.log message, like that. So what this is going to do when we run it, it's going to invoke this function, which creates a new promise, it calls set timeout, and then it will resolve to some message after the time has passed. So let's run it. Boom. One, two, bam. OK, two have passed. <laughs> I should have said I should have said two seconds have passed. <laughs> Let me just fix that real quick. Two seconds have passed. So if I redefine that, invoke it again, boom, all right, two seconds have passed. That's great. So that's promises in a nutshell. You may be wondering. Why would we use promises? And um, this is very common to see when you're loading data onto a page or making a network request of any kind because it takes time to, let's say, load a CSV file onto the page. Let's use promises to simulate the network request in our cars report. So we've got this cars function that defines the cars here, but what we want to do is simulate a network request. So instead of cars, I'm going to say, you know, export, instead of exporting cars, 
I'm going to say export const get cars from a network request, or it's going to simulate that. And what this is going to be is a function that returns a new promise. And this promise takes as input a function that takes as input resolve. And then in the body of this function, we can use set timeout to wait for, say, uh, two seconds. The first argument to set timeout should be a function that will call resolve and it will pass in cars. So now we're exporting a function get cars that returns a promise that resolves to the cars array after two seconds. But it's still called cars.js, so I'm just gonna rename this to get cars.js. And then inside index.js, I'm gonna say, all right, import get cars from get cars, and then I'm going to say, all right, get the cars dot then, and then this will be a function that takes as input cars, and then in the body of this function, this is where we can generate our report, because only after two seconds do we have access to cars, because it's passed in over here. So what we should see is, after two seconds, after the page loads, it should generate this report. But it looks like something is going wrong. Let me open up the developer tools and take a look. GetCars.then is not a function. Ah, yes, I forgot to invoke GetCars. Yeah, GetCars is a function. All right, it looked like it worked this time. See, after two seconds, it, uh, it displayed this report. And usually when something is loading, you can give an indication of loading. So what I'm going to do is set the text content to be loading, dot, 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 at first. And then after two seconds, change it to this report. Let me just make it uppercase to be more classy. So it says loading for two seconds, and then boom, the report loads. So that's how you can use promises to simulate a network request. And by the way, if this were a really a network request, this code would not change at all. Only the internals of get cars would have to change. All right, so we've covered everything we want to cover from Eloquent JavaScript. I want to briefly mention this other document, ECMAScript 6 features, at this URL right here. This is a fantastic reference that's more comprehensive than the stuff I've covered in this video, and I would recommend reading through it. It's got really nice examples for all ES6 features, and it's good to use as a reference and to learn about these other features of the language. All right, that concludes our introduction to JavaScript. I hope this gives you a leg up and uh, makes it so you can actually do stuff with JavaScript. So thanks for watching. Take care.